So Jolly is a professor of was a professor of communication at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the founder and executive director of the Media Education Foundation. He's the producer of over 40 documentaries and the author of six books and numerous scholarly and popular articles. Many of you have probably seen his 2016 film, The Occupation of the American Mind, which was, that's right. That film was narrated by Roger Waters and focuses on pro-Israel public relations efforts within the United States and how the US government is working within the United States to influence American media coverage of Israel. Today, he will be discussing whether American news organizations are getting better or worse in the quality, balance, and accuracy of their Middle East reporting. Thank you so much. Um, actually, just to follow up to Radhika's presentation, she mentioned this panel <laughs> that um, I'd organized at UMass uh, with, uh, with Roger, with Mark Lamont Hill, Linda Sarsour, uh, Dave Zyron, and there was a lawsuit against it. Um, and they really, I mean, it, when you organize these events, I really think it's up to people who have some protection to take the, to take the lead on this. This should not be up to students. Students should not be on the front lines of these things. They're the most vulnerable. The people who should be taking the risk, and it's not, you know, there might be some risk, but it's like on a university, should be tenured professors. In fact, and when that happened to, when, when that happened to us, um, you know, I was on the front line. I, I got in touch with, um, with Roger, with, with Mark, with Linda, with Dave Zyron, and within 15 minutes, they had all agreed to put their names on a lawsuit or to, 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 to fight this. Um, so the, those, of us who have, those of us who have some power in these kinds of institutions, I think we, we need, to, need to use it. I also learned a great deal about what puts pressure on university, professor, on university presidents. Um, I've been teaching at UMass for a while, and there's been lots of complaints about me from the kind of the lunatic right, you know, from the Zionist right, from, from camera, etc. And the, my, my, the university president uh, kind of loved that. He, he was like, oh, I can protect, I can, you know, protect you against, um, against camera, against his love. And he was, but the moment, the moment the pressure came from donors, the moment the pressure came from donors, he caved. And so it taught me a lot that the pressure is not just it's right wing pressure, it's pressure from people that really matter. It's pressure, as always, uh, with money. Um, anyway, that's, that's, I just, that was just provoked by what Radhika said <laughs> about our event. Again, I'm on the uh, unenviable position of you know, speaking of the last session, which means almost everything I wanted to talk about has been talked about already. Uh, and it means I have to follow people, you know, like Gideon, uh, like Hanan and We have to share a stage with Roger Waters. It's, uh, it's not enviable, but I'll, hopefully there'll be a few things I can say that might be, might be interesting. Um, the Chinese philosopher Confucius was once asked what he would do if, were ever, if he were ever to rule the state. Like someone asked him, what would you do if you, if you were in charge? And he answered, quote, he would rectify the language. Rectify the language. That is, he would control the categories through which people perceive the world. As we are a symbolic and storytelling species, something always stands between us and our understanding of the world. That something is language and stories and culture. If you can control the categories of thought, then you don't need soldiers and police on street corners to control a population. You can control them in their own heads, through their own imaginations. As Gore Vidal, uh, where I got this story from, about Confucius from, <laughs> wrote in this article, he said, quote, as societies grow decadent, the language grows decadent too. Words are used to disguise, not to illuminate action. You liberate a city by destroying it. Actually, I'm sure that's what Russian propaganda is doing right now in terms of how it's reporting Ukraine. Words are used to confuse so that election time, people will solemnly vote against their own interests. This rectification of the language is, of course, the central insight of American public relations. Ivy Lee, uh, the first major proponent of what came to be known as the industry of public relations, once declared, and I actually think it's true, 
and what in, in a philosophical sense, he once declared, there is no such thing as the truth. Quote, he said, the effort to state an absolute fact is simply an attempt to give you my interpretation of the facts. Because something always stands between us and our, and our perception of reality. So it is always up for grabs. Similarly, Edward Bernays, um, who has been credited with creating the modern public relations industry, was very open that rational elites had to keep the emotional and unruly rabble under control by use of propaganda. He, he thought propaganda was a great term, was a great word. In fact, it's the title of one of his books. In fact, he often used to say, he said, I hope what I'm doing, because he believed that elites had to control the unruly mob. They weren't capable of, in, in a democracy, you can't let the mob rule. Uh, and he often used to say, I hope what I'm doing is propaganda and not impropaganda. The Israel lobby has learned the lesson of Confucius very well and has put it into practice in a way that should be taught in public relations schools. They really should. They should, they should, they should be a required, uh, required study of public relations schools. They have turned, they've managed to turn reality on its head. They've been successful in framing a vicious settler colonial program of violence, eviction, and occupation into a defensive project of civilization against barbaric Muslim terrorist hordes. <clears throat> As I said, it should be taught in PR schools. You can turn reality on its head. Now, it wasn't always like this. It's always good to take a little bit of a, a historical perspective, um, especially if you look back to American media. Up until the early 1980s, when there was some form of what could be called journalism actually existing in the US, that no longer is the case, but then when there was some form of journalism that existed, coverage of Israel occasionally turned very critical, especially the, during the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, the, the bombing of Beirut, and the ensuing massacres of civilians at the refugee camps of Shabra and Shatila. We play the attack first, on Palestinian um, guerrilla targets in Lebanon today. From the sky, the howl of Israeli jets, bombing and bombing. Tonight, Israel has never been closer to, nor more in control of an Arab capital. In the summer of 1982, Israel invaded neighboring Lebanon in an attempt to drive the Palestinian Liberation Organization out of its encampments on the southern border with Israel. Israeli officials justified the attack as a defensive action required to take out terrorists. But as the story played out on American television, a different narrative began to emerge, one that presented Israel as the aggressor. What in the world is going on? Israel's security problem on its border is 50 miles to the south. What's an Israeli army doing here in Beirut? The answer is that we are now dealing with an imperial Israel, which is solving its problems in someone else's country. World opinion be damned. The Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982 was a watershed. It was Israel breaking out beyond its immediate region to aggressively attack another country, and it was a bit of a shock to many people. Israel was always that gallant little underdog democracy fighting for survival against all the odds. Now the Israelis have annexed East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights settled down more or less permanently on the West Bank and occupied close to half of Lebanon. In the interests of self-defense, that gallant little underdog Israel has suddenly started behaving like the neighborhood bully. By the time the war was over, the Israeli military would kill 17,000 Lebanese and Palestinians and wound another 30,000, almost all of them civilians. In West Beirut, hospitals are so taxed with the injured that they have become specialized. This center takes only burn victims of phosphorus shells. Shrapnel cases, concussions, and fractures are directed to other facilities. Such coverage is unthinkable today. <laughs> Nothing, no coverage of the various attacks on Gaza came close to this level of critique. Uh, I imagine, I mean, it's actually close to what the, the mainstream media is now doing with, uh, with Ukraine because the victims are the right kind of victims. The answer to this, from Israel's perspective, the answer to this negative coverage 
was not, of course, a change in policy, but a change in the rectification of the language. It was a change in the definitions and the categories of thought. One of the lessons of Confucius, of public relations, is that reality does not pour into people's heads. That our perception of reality goes through the categories of language that reflect the categories of those humans who can control that process. That is what cultural power is about, is to control those categories, to occupy people in their own imaginations. To devise, so after 1982 and after this coverage, to devise appropriate strategies in 1984, a conference was organized in Jerusalem by supporters of the Zionist enterprise. Two years after the Lebanon invasion, the American Jewish Congress sponsored a conference in Jerusalem to devise a formal public relations strategy known in Hebrew as Hasbara. Participants included PR and advertising executives, media specialists, journalists, and leaders of major Jewish groups. According to a brochure from the Congress, no single event brought home the need for a more effective Hasbara or information program more persuasively than the 1982 war in Lebanon and the events that followed. As one conference participant put it, Israel is no longer perceived to be Little David, but Goliath steamrolling across the map. The primary aim of the conference was to develop strategies to spin unpopular Israeli policies and to counter negative press coverage by shaping the media frame in advance. News doesn't just jump into a camera, the conference delegate said. It's directed, it's managed, it's made accessible. Israel-based advertising executive Martin Fenton would put it in even more blunt terms. Propaganda is not a dirty word, he said. Face it, we are in the game of changing people's minds and making them think differently. To accomplish that, we need propaganda. The conference was chaired by US advertising executive Carl Spielvogel, the legendary ad man who created the highly acclaimed Miller Lite beer ads in the 1970s. The choice of Spielvogel makes perfect sense. He's known as a master of image inversion and rebranding. The ad man responsible for transforming Miller Lite which had been viewed before as a woman's beer into a manly beer that tough guys would drink. But the best part is that it tastes so great. <laughs> the best part is it's less filling. Nah, it tastes great. Less filling. His job with Israel would require the same kind of rebranding, only in the opposite direction, to help soften the image of a country that's coming to be seen as a bully. So he recommends creating a cabinet post dedicated exclusively to explaining policy whose job would not be setting policy, but presenting it in the most attractive way to the rest of the world. Classic PR is to say the problem is not the policy, it's the presentation. When the policies are so reprehensible that many people become critical, rather than acknowledge there's anything wrong with the policy, there's a doubling down on the PR effort. Okay, so I should mention um, that this is, uh, these are clips from our film, The Occupation of the American Mind, um, and the narration you hear is from Roger, who, he's not in the room right now, but you can, his voice is, uh, his voice is still here. Um, and there's nothing accidental about this Hasbara or propaganda. There's nothing accidental about it. It's not, it's not, it's not thought of casually. When Israel has committed another, yet another atrocity against the Palestinian people, the frame and language we hear in the mainstream media is the result of intensive research about what words work the best. Nothing accidental about it. We should be clear uh, that the talking points that circulate in the corporate media have been tested out with focus groups. A number of well-funded public relations organizations have emerged within the United States to help Israel justify its policies especially the occupation and settlements on security grounds. One of these groups is the Israel Project. In 2009, the Israel Project turned to conservative pollster and rebranding expert Frank Luntz. Frank Luntz. This is the man that reframed the estate tax as the death tax. Healthcare reform as government takeover of healthcare. Now, some critics have called Luntz a spin doctor who manipulates public emotion, but Luntz would reframe that as Fox News analyst. The Israel Project hired him to determine which talking points used by Israeli and U.S. officials over time 
have been most effective in maintaining American sympathy for Israel. Luntz wrote up his recommendations in a 2009 report called the Global Language Dictionary. If you want to understand how the propaganda works, especially in the US, you need to read the Luntz document. He's really clear that the occupation and especially the settlements are a problem. And he points to polls that show a large majority of Americans actually think that Israel should retreat to the 67 borders. In fact, he says, when you talk about land in terms of 67, you completely flip American sentiment against you. But, and this is his solution, if you bring up the danger of terrorism, you win back the support. The key, Lund says, is to claim that the fight is over ideology, not land, about terror, not territory. In fact, it's these three words, terror, not territory, uh, that we need to understand uh, how, how Israeli propaganda works. Terror, that is, <laughs> territory is about history. Territory is about history. I once had a student tell me that the most radical class I taught was where I went over the actual history using maps of the conflict. That once you know the facts, it's very clear what the just and moral position should be, especially if you're neutral within this. Uh, that is why the history is made out to be so complex that only experts can, sleep, can speak. The reality, of course, is that the so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, is the simplest and most straightforward in the modern world to explain. If you just tell the story of territory, if you, te if you keep, if you just tell the history, <laughs> if you stick essentially to the facts. So Lunt says, this is his advice, he says, avoid history, avoid facts, focus instead on terrorism. Um, in the same report, uh, Luntz goes on to outline strategies for how to deal with horrific civilian casualties uh, that will in inevitably make their way before the eyes of the American public. In 2012, and again in 2014, Israel launched two more devastating attacks on Gaza. Israel can saturate the media with its spokespeople, but there's still the problem of massive Palestinian casualties showing up on television screens. You can't make those images go away. An Israeli official actually said, in the war of pictures we lose. So you need to correct, explain, or balance it in other ways. Here again, the Luntz document spells out which talking points have been most effective in spinning the brutal reality of Palestinian casualties. He says the first thing the pro-Israeli spokespeople should do is to express empathy for the innocent victims. Unfortunately, innocents do get hurt, and we, we really grieve that. We're sad for every civilian casualty. The entire situation is, is tragic. Once you've done that, Lund says, you also have to get people to empathize with Israelis by describing what life is like for them, living in constant fear of Hamas rocket attacks. So again and again, we hear the focused, tested phrase, that the rockets are raining down on Israel. We have thousands of rockets raining down on our civilians. Rockets were raining down on Israel. And the advertising executive will tell you the essence of propaganda is repetition. Rockets raining down on southern Israel. Rockets raining down on Israel. Well, Hamas rockets rain down on Israeli border towns. Then ask the American people, what would you do? So what would you do in the United States? Can you imagine um, what America would do if it were facing a similar threat. We always try to ask you the question we ask ourselves. What will you do? What would you do? What would you do if more than 3,000 rockets had been fired on your cities? What would you do? 3,000 rockets. What would you do if terrorists were tunneling under your frontier? What would you do if three kids are kidnapped because of a tunnel network? What sort of question is this? Of course, anybody would act to defend themselves against unprovoked aggression, but it is a question that is completely devoid of any context. What drives the society to a point where after multiple devastating wars, they continue to resist with these most feeble methods? They don't want you to ask that question. They don't want you to ask what is behind this? What's the history here? Who are these people? Where did they come from? Why are they so desperate? No, they want you to understand Israeli behavior. 
Israeli behavior is always characterized as a reaction to unprovoked violence. Okay, sorry, the, the audio and the video somehow <laughs> got out of sync, which is why it didn't make sense for a while. Um, but I think you get the, the basic point still just from the audio. The story never starts with the, with the violence of the occupation. The story always starts with Hamas rockets. In fact, if Hamas did not exist, Israel would have to invent it. So it could be provoked to respond, as Yusef Manir says at the end, in this most feeble of ways. Okay, it really matters where history starts, where the story starts. If it starts with the violence of the, of the, of the occupation, if it starts with the violence of the occupation, then what the Palestinians are engaged in is legitimate resistance. If, however, it starts with Hamas rockets, then what the Palestinians are doing is terrorism. One of those stories, it works much better for Israel than the other one. The function of PR is to put this story, that the responsibility for the violence lies with the Palestinians, to put those ideas and your words into someone else's mouth so that it does not appear as your speech. That is the essence of public relations. It is how it is different from advertising. Advertising is visible and it's clear who is speaking. The best PR is invisible because you have got someone else, in this case, uh, hapless and hopeless American journalists, to mouth your words. And they don't, I'm not even sure they know what they're doing. Get the next clip. So you end up with reporting that gives way more priority and weight to the official Israeli perspective than to the Palestinian one. Look at how American media covered Israel's 2014 attack on Gaza. A keyword search of all the major networks showed that over the course of the 51-day assault, Israel's ongoing military siege and blockade of Gaza were barely mentioned compared to the thousands of times Hamas rocket attacks on Israel were mentioned. Why is Hamas launching missiles into population centers of Israel? The basic propaganda frame is built into the very assumptions journalists bring to the table. Since Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005, 8,000 rockets have been fired from Gaza into Israel. This is how propaganda works. It works by getting your words in the mouths of other people especially the mouths of supposedly objective media commentators. I'm wondering, though, whether you're outraged by the conduct of Hamas, starting the conflict by firing rockets, building tunnels to kill and kidnap Israelis, being more than willing to sacrifice Palestinian lives by embedding them into, into their own kind of arsenal and using them, as Israel contends, as human shields. Do you have a level of outrage at Hamas itself? It doesn't seem like propaganda at all. It just seems like news. And this goes across. Because it's coming out of the words, out of the mouths of supposedly objective journalists, it just appears to be, just appears to be journalism. It just appears to be news. That is how PR works. The best PR, you get someone else to say your words. Uh, actually, the question for me, um, I've never been able to kind of answer it properly. The question for me is whether the so-called journalists means that does Jake Tapper know what he's doing? Does David Goffrey know what he's doing? Does he know that he's simply mouthing Israeli propaganda? Or do they really think they're doing journalism? Are they so deluded? That's, that's always my question. Are they, like, are they essentially evil on the one hand? They know what they're doing. <laughs> they're going to do it anyway for whatever reason. Or are they just so stupid that they don't know that they are being manipulated in this way? Now, I've I actually don't know uh, the answer to that question. Uh, it actually would be an interesting research question to do. But the latest Israeli attacks, let me turn now to the, to the, to the, to the current. The latest Israeli attacks on Gaza in the summer of 2021 indicates, in fact, that there might be something new that is happening now outside the world of corporate broadcast media. The Israeli bombardment of Gaza and the events of Sheikh Jarrah elicited reactions we had not seen before. While the bulk of the coverage, especially on TV, followed the usual pattern of blaming Palestinians for the violence, there were really, for the first time, significant alternative voices being heard 
that were pro-Palestinian. A new generation of Palestinian American voices have put themselves into position where the mainstream media feels as though they have to invite them on from another perspective. For example, the New York Times uh, had an op-ed from Youssef Manir, and, the C and CNN's Christian Am Anapur uh, had on uh, Nora Arakat as a guest, where Nora argued uh, for the legitimate right of Palestinians, including Hamas, to resist the colonial oppression. And Professor um, uh, uh, Rashid Khalidi, the most kind of eminent historian of the Palestinian quest for emancipation, has been an important voice in the public domain. Something changed. When, we, when, when I watched the media coverage pretty cl closely, something started to change, at least on the margins. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for this, I think, um, including the decades-long work of people of, of, of uh, websites like Electronic Intifada and Phil Wise's work with, uh, with Mondo Wise, um, <laughs> as, well as, the activists as well as the activists associated with the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement who have carried on doing their work even though they are under constant threat. Uh, there are also the new powerful voices of elected Palestinian American officials, such as Rashida Tlaib. Uh, there is now a debate within the Democratic Party, which didn't exist before. And actually, I think that the person who, who deserves a lot of credit for this is Bernie Sanders, who in 2006, <laughs> who in 2016, at the, one of the debates, um, the primary debates, actually mentioned uh, Palestine <laughs> and Palestine human rights. Uh, in, the, in the, the primary, uh, in, the, in the debate in, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, there are, as Radhika said, there are uh, hundreds of campus organizations, camp there's hundreds of students, hundreds of SJP uh, chapters around the country. Uh, and I think increasingly, the visible links between the Black Lives Matter movement and the quest for Palestinian emancipation has been very, very important, especially for younger generations. In fact, it's really interesting to see how you know, liberal Zionists get themselves into knots, on the one hand, trying to support Black Lives Matter, which, they, which almost everyone does, and at the same time trying to deny that Palestinian human rights has anything to do with those same movements. So a lot of things, I think, I think actually are changing. Um, there are also the widespread, uh, the unprecedented reports from Beth Salem, from Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International that all use the A word, all use apartheid. And make no mistake, Israeli officials are scared stiff about this, especially in terms of what will happen internationally. At the start of the year, at the start of the year, even before the amnesty report, uh, Yair Lapid, uh, Israel's foreign minister said, this was at the start of 2022. He said, we think that in the coming year, there will be debate that is unprecedented in its venom and in its radio radioactivity around the words, Israel is an apartheid state. It will be a tangible threat. Okay, that, that, that is not, that's, that's the words of someone who is scared about what is happening. Um, uh, I mean, as, as Gideon said, but there may not be a lot of discussion about this within Israel, maybe ignored, but it's not ignored around the rest of the world, and it's going to, I think, change the debate. But the major, uh, use of, uh, the major change, I think, has been in the use of social media, although, again, as Radhika mentioned, there's been significant censorship in this as well. Uh, but for the most part, social media has been freed from the usual close corporate controls. And it's managed to tell another story. Millions of people have been able to share images and videos that define the situation in a different way. Actresses like Viola Davis, uh, like Emma Watson, have used a significant social media presence to allow different narratives into the frame. And social media has succeeded in giving a face to an increasingly racist and rabid Zionism that I don't think was possible before. There was the viral video that went out of the Zionist occupier of the Sheikh, one of the Sheikh Jarrah houses that actually gave, this is what Zionism looks like, this is what Zionism sounds like. 
Actually, mostly what it sounds like is right-wing Americans from Brooklyn uh, <laughs> occupying the, the, the occupying land. They, right? But they gave, they gave a voice to that. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But you're you're not you're It's easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. <laughs> Okay, people who knew nothing about house occupations, people who, nothing, who knew nothing about Zionism now suddenly had <laughs> images, they suddenly had stories, and they suddenly had a face that they could put to it. I imagine most of you have seen that video before. I just said it went, it went viral, uh, and it went viral on social media. So I think there is some, something, something is shifting. Uh, I think public opinion is shifting. Um, and perhaps most surprisingly, perhaps most surprisingly, there's even been a breakthrough on Fox News, where Geraldo Rivera, I know, it's just a shock, <laughs> where Geraldo Rivera astonished everyone by merely stating the stark reality of what was happening in Gaza. And I want you to look at the faces of the other people who are on the screen when you see this clip. Um, Geraldo, it, it sounds like you are sympathetic to Tlaib's argument here. I am indeed, Martha. I think that people have to recognize what Gaza Strip is. It's one of the most menacing, melancholy places uh, on Earth that I've ever reported from. It's a 20-mile uh, long strip of desert by the sea, two million Palestinians trapped inside by a brutal blockade enforced by Egypt on the southwest, Israel, every place else. It's a crowded cesspool, highest unemployment on Earth, over 50 percent. Everyone and everything going into and out of Gaza is controlled by Israel, electricity, fuel, airspace, ports, cell phone service, even who gets to farm those meager fields they have. It's effectively one of the world's largest prison camps and it's being bombed with bombs supplied by the United States of America. It's outrageous that we gave Israel these hundreds of millions of dollars worth of weapons without insisting on a ceasefire now. Why not a ceasefire now? We have dozens of Palestinian children who have been killed in the last week with American bombs. I have no proposed Why solution that, to this conflict. I have no proposed solution, better minds than mine. Maybe General Jack Keane can help and floundered, uh, frustrated by this complexity. I know this, though, Martha, and I want our audience to, the fact that the United States of America is providing Israel many of the weapons Israel is using today to kill Palestinian civilians without even demanding a ceasefire. Tlaib is right. That makes us complicit in an ongoing crime against humanity. That's on Fox News. <laughs> and it's, it's been delivered by someone who knows how television works. Someone who knows you don't stop talking. Someone who knows exactly how to speak in, in sound bites. So even Fox News now, I wouldn't say starting to shift, but there are breakthroughs here and there. And public opinion, I think, is starting to shift, especially generationally. Uh, and I think the reason for this, one of the reasons for why the, the shift is happening, is that people are more educated about the context. I don't think it was an accident that what happened in the summer of 2021 was connected to the events of Sheikh Jarrah. Suddenly, the Hamas rockets, which is normally where the story starts, suddenly, for millions of people, that was not where the story started. The story started in the evictions in Sheikh Jarrah, and suddenly the context starts to change. That's the great worry 
that Frank Luntz talked about. When the, when the focus shifts, discussion shifts to territory, when the focus shifts to occupation, when the focus shifts to eviction, when the focus shifts to house demolition, then public opinion shifts also. Um, it's always tough to, anticipate, to, to say what's going to happen in the future, but I think it's going to be very difficult to get the genie back in the bottle, uh, especially for younger generations. For a long time, the propaganda of the Israel lobby had the characteristics of a Gordian knot. You know what a Gordian knot is. Something that is so powerful and tightly uh, intertwined that it seemed impossible to unravel. But we have to remember there are two parts of the lesson of Confucius. One is the importance of rectifying the language. The other is that there is nothing natural about this rectification. That the categories of language do not fall fully formed from heaven, but are created by human beings. And therefore, they can be changed. Therefore, they can be struggled over. Therefore, new categories of resistance can be carved out. The categories of culture are a site of contestation. They are a place where struggle can take place. The Gordian knot of Israeli propaganda will not be cut through with one cut. I know that's what Alexander the Great did or supposedly did. That's not going to happen with, with this. If that, is, if that is what Israeli propaganda is, we will have to pick at the threads one at a time until they fray and break. I believe we are at the beginning of this process. Uh, there's no guarantee that we will be successful. Politics is not about guarantees. Um, and, and even if you can shift public opinion, which I think is starting to happen, there is no guarantee that elites will enact policy that works in its own interest. If that was the case, then we would have you know, uh, universal health care now, which is you know, powerful, which is supported by most people. We would have, you know, real movement on climate change. We would have more money spent on education. So there's no guarantee that changes in public opinion will lead to changes in policy, but it is a prerequisite. As I said, there's never a guarantee in politics. But I've been more hopeful in the last six months than I've, or in the last few years than I have before. Uh, and I think that even though there's no guarantee, um, I think at least we are now in the game. Thank you. I'll go to the podium. I think we're going to do the questions for you first. Okay. So just a quick question about the, uh, the recent amnesty report that came out, and, and you know, especially with the New York Times not covering it. So someone just asked how we can get the media to begin to cover that report. <laughs> I mean, that's again is the question about journalists. Um, I mean, the fact that the New York Times uh, has not covered this this immensely important report um, says a great deal about the pressures that are going on internal to the, to, in, internal to the to New York Times. And again, I think the only, the only thing you can do is to put pressure on as readers, as consumers, and complain and write and, and draw attention to it. The more, the more attention is drawn to the fact that the New York Times has not covered it, and that the New York Times then has to deal with the question of why haven't they covered it, which they've had to do. <laughs> Activists have raised this issue, uh, and they forced the New York Times, you know, and the New York Times ended up saying, oh, well, we don't cover every little report that comes out. And, you know, but, but they've been forced into saying these nonsensical things. I think that's the, we're, the struggle, the contestation we're talking about takes a pretty broad form. Thank you. Another question here, kind of especially with the corporate media, how would you assess the influence of advertisers on what journalists write or comment about? 
I mean, in general, advertisers have an immense uh, impact on, um, on news coverage if it affects their interests. I mean, if it affects the overall context, but if it affects their interests. I don't think, I don't think advertisers, I mean, I, I think most and more important is ownership of media rather than the way it is funded through advertisers. Um, advertisers, want, they, they want to pay attention to the context within which their ads appear, but I don't think foreign affairs has much to do with that. So on this issue, in general, advertisers have a, an immense amount of influence on, on, on broadcasts. Uh, media, uh, on this issue, I don't think they do. Thank you. I, just, uh, I guess someone is curious here about um, some individual assessments. If you just think there's any particular media outlet that has really changed in, in recent years or a particular journalist or, or stuff like that that you see as groundbreaking. That's a good question. I'm not sure I... Besides Geraldo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think there's been a lot of shift. I mean, there's been shifts in small places. I mean, you know, Yusef Munir being able to write uh, an op-ed for the New York Times, that's new, so that's a small little thing. Whether, again, my assessment of this based just on what I, I did look at broadcast media quite a lot during this last campaign, uh, or during the, you know, the, during the, from the, the, the attacks in the, in the summer, and broadcast news is almost exactly the same. Like in what we covered in 2016, broadcast news, it looks essentially the same, the same kinds of things. Where the changes are is on the margins. Where the changes are is in independent media. Where the changes are is in other places. And eventually those changes, I think, will put pressure on the mainstream media. They don't just, they don't just change overnight. The pressures will come from. And so the more that independent media uh, and that we all do what we're supposed to do, the more pressure there will be on straight mainstream media to, I mean, I think Geraldo is, <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to kind of do look one thing, which is like an inter intervention, now suddenly people have to, like, if Geraldo Rivera is saying this, what, right, they, at least they're, they're actually asking that, 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 that question. Great. All right. Next question here is, how does the timing of Israel's aggressions fit within its Hasbara strategy? Uh, it's absolutely vital. I mean, they, whatever they, um, I mean, in, in the film, we, um, in, in, the, in the occupation of Norica Mind, uh, we talk about the 2000 and 2008 attack on Gaza. And we show that actually the, the when, you know, the, the 2008, um, uh, uh, I want to, the attack was precipitated by Israel breaking the ceasefire. It wasn't precipitated by mass rockets. It was precipitated by, by Israel breaking the, 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 the ceasefire uh, by, killing some pal by killing Palestinians. And the New York Times reported that, but it reported it on like page eight. And that happened on the same day that President Obama was elected for the first time. So although there was some basic, some, some minimal coverage of that, no one was paying any attention to this. All they were paying attention to was Obama. Then when the Hamas rockets happened, <laughs> that's, when, that's when history starts, that's when the coverage starts. So I think, uh, I think they are very, very cognizant of when the attacks take place and to make sure that the ground has been, has been carefully tilled for the attacks. Great, I just have one final question here. Uh, this question is, I guess, about what people can do in the sense and asking, you know, do news organizations really care what people think? Almost like politicians, right? Do, do the media care what people think? If they see readers or viewers shifting in their views, will they respond likewise? I'm not sure if they'll respond likewise, but they will care because that, that's their audience. So even if you think no one is going to listen, you should complain. <laughs> you should write and you should, you should complain. Um, and in, in one journal, if, 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 one, if they hear one story, perhaps not. If they hear two or three or four, it starts to change the context within which they start to think about their own works. So, so I think what I would, is, what I would stress is that the, the, site of struggle, the site of culture as a, as, a, as a site of contestation is very broad. And that we can, all of us actually, consumers and producers, can all of us participate in that struggle. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for your insights here today.